Hi, this is Coach Heichel. I'm back and I'm bringing you a podcast today over Unit 4.2, Cell Transport. So we're going to talk about cell boundaries, the, the cell membrane, and why we consider it selectively permeable. We're also going to talk about cell transport as in osmosis, diffusion, active transport, and endo and exocytosis. So let's begin. Okay, so the reason you have a cell membrane is because you want to maintain a balance. Organisms are always subject to constant change in their environment. Things like temperature, the amount of sunlight, chemicals that we ingest, the amount of water, glucose, and other nutrients within our cells, and the buildup of waste products. We all have a need to maintain a balance within our cells. So the cells must do this. So they must maintain what's called homeostasis. So that's why our cell membranes are what's called selectively permeable because only some materials are allowed to pass through the plasma membrane while the others are held in. So if they want to let it in, they're going to let it in. If they don't want it in, they're going to keep it out. It selects what to let in and selects what to let out. So going back to the plasma membrane or the cell membrane, it's made up of two layers of phospholipid molecules. So phospholipid is lipids with phosphorus embedded in there. Okay, And within that, you have these proteins that are going to be embedded within the cell membrane. Okay, these can be proteins. Some of these are going to be some carbohydrates. These little white little tails, our heads, sorry, are going to be your lipids, and you're going to have your, your tails, of course. So phospholipids have polar water-soluble heads and nonpolar insoluble tails. So that means everything right here is going to be hydrophilic, which means it's going to love water. Everything right here on the middle is going to be hydrophobic, or it's going to be as far away from water as it possibly can. Okay, the heads point outward to prevent the water water environment inside and outside from dissolving from the membrane. So, what are the proteins in the cell membrane? First of all, you have receptors. You're going to have channels. This is going to be your most common. Are going to be channel proteins. You're going to have markers. The markers are just going to simply identify what's coming in and what's coming out. So more onto the channels later. So there's several different types of, um, of transport methods. The first type is, is passive transport, and there's three types of passive transport. You've got diffusion, osmosis, and then you have facilitated diffusion. Whereas your active transport, we're going to talk about cell pumps, kind of, sort of, just a little bit. But the main two are going to be endocytosis and exocytosis. So onto it. So passive transport requires no energy. So the molecules are going to move from a high concentration to an area of low concentration. They're going to move with, with what's called the concentration gradient. So you have a very high concentration over here. You have a very low concentration over here. They're going to diffuse their way out amongst the, um, the solution. So here's a basic example of diffusion. You've got a very, very cl clustered high concentration of these purple dots over here, and they're going to diffuse amongst the entire volume of this square or rectangle, whatever you want to call it. So that's a basic brief diffusion. Think about standing in the corner of a room and spraying Lysol. Eventually, when you go to the other side of the room, you're going to smell the Lysol because those, those Lysol particles are going to diffuse amongst the entire space. So diffusion is the movement of the solute. The solute is what's being dissolved. And it's the particles moving from a high concentration to an area of low concentration. So the salt, again, high concentration to an area of low concentration. So since there's more of these on this side than there is on this side, they're going to simply move across the cell membrane and try to balance out the numbers on the inside and on the outside. So again, diffusion is movement of the solute or salt or what's being dissolved from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So eventually this is going to lead to what's called the dynamic equilibrium. So they're always going to continue to go in and out of the cell. They're never going to stop moving. They're just going to keep it in a constant state of the same amount on the inside and the same amount on the outside. So facilitated diffusion is just like diffusion. It's the movement of um, solute or salt from high concentration to low concentration, but this is when they're too big to pass through the bilayer. So they go through what's called these, these channel proteins. So they're gonna be identified, the channel proteins are gonna pull them through and push them out on the other side. So here's two examples. These do not require energy. The random motion is gonna bring these particles to the cell membrane. So again, we're still talking about passive transport, facilitated diffusion. 
they're going to pass through the bilayer with the proteins that are embedded. So it's common movement of sugars and amino acids. Things that are too big to simply pass through the phospholipid bilayer are going to use these channel proteins to move things through. And again, it's the salts or the solute from high concentration to low concentration. So again, these little guys are trying to get through. Since there's five on the outside, one on the inside, so what are they going to do? They're going to find a channel protein. The channel protein's going to move them through. So now you have three on this side and three on that side. So again, these were the solute particles or what's being dissolved or salt, if you just want to keep it simple. So osmosis is a different type of diffusion. It is diffusion, but it's diffusion simply of water. Okay, Osmosis is the movement of water. Again, it's from a high concentration to low concentration, but now we're just talking about water or the solvent. Okay, so it's going to simply pass across the cell membrane like so. So the numbers are trying to get evened out. So again, osmosis is a movement of water from high concentration to area of low concentration. Osmosis is a movement of water or the solvent. Okay, what's doing the dissolving? So there's an example of really what's happening inside your cells. So you've got all three of these functions happening all at one time. So you get your osmosis, your diffusion, and your facilitated diffusion. They're all going to happen at the exact same time. They're not going to happen one and then the other one's going to go and then the other one's going to get their turn. They're all happening all at the same time, nonstop, trying to get that constant state of equilibrium. So what would happen to the animal cell in each of the beakers? So you've got 80% water and 100% water. So 80% is within inside this direct cell right here. So 80% within this area. And 100% is going to be on the, the outside. So what's going to happen? Well, if we're talking about the movement of water, okay, because that's the only thing we have, this has zero salt. This is going to have about 20% salt because it's going to be the difference. Okay, so you're going to have about, oh, sorry. So you're going to have about 20% other, right? Okay. 20% other. So what do you think is going to happen? Okay, well, if we got 100% water here, 80% water here, and they're trying to maintain that stable balance, well, t two things are going to happen. The salt's going to rush out of this, right? It's going to try to balance out this water a little bit more. And water is going to try to rush in, okay? So they're going to try to get that constant state of equilibrium. So on this one, we have 80% water surrounding and 20% dissolved substances. Well, on the inside, we have 80% water as well with, again, we're going to have 20% other. So what do we think is going to happen here? We got 20% other and 80%. Well, it's already in equilibrium, so what, it's what's considered isotonic. Nothing's going to happen. It's already in a state of equilibrium, so they're going to continually go in and out, but the, the percentages are going to stay the same. So our last one, we have 80%. So the other 20% is this going to be our salt or other dissolved substances or the solutes. So 70% water, 30%. So area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So the water is going to rush out. Whereas the 30% dissolved is going to rush in. Okay, We're going to talk briefly more about all this in a few more slides. So there's just a basic example of what's happening. So again, isotonic. I already said that isotonic is where everything is the same. It's the inside's the same, the outside's the same. The solution in which the concentration of dissolved substances is the same as the concentration inside the cell. So if you place the cell in isotonic, water molecules are still going to move in and out, but there's no net movement of water. So they're going to maintain that overall dynamic equilibrium. Whereas a hypotonic solution, if you place something in a hypotonic solution, water is going to move into a cell, okay? Water is going to move because there's a lower concentration of something inside the cell. So the concentration of the dissolved substances is lower than the concentration inside the cell, okay? 
Something's going to rush in. The water's going to rush in. It's going to get bigger. I always remembered it because hippos or hypos get bigger, right? Big, a hippo can get big. This O can get really, really big. So what happens in a hypotonic solution? Well, animal cells are eventually going to sell. Our, our cells will actually swell and go through what's called lysis, and they might even burst. Okay? Some protists have what's called a contractual vacuole, which remove it. Plant cells will not burst because they have that, that cell wall, remember? They're not going to burst. They need water. They're just going to store it in their vacuoles. So plant cells actually prefer hypotonic solutions because of the turgor pressure. Turgor pressure is what allows plants to stand up out of the ground. So a hypertonic solution is a solution in which the concentration of dissolved substances is higher than the concentration inside. So you place a cell inside of a hypertonic solution and the water is going to move out. It's going to get littler. I always remembered it because little kids are hyper. So if the cell gets little, it's going to be hyper like the little kids. Okay? Water is going to move out. The cell is going to shrink. So animal cells are going to shrivel. They're going to get a lot smaller. Plant cells are going to lose water. The cell wall will, 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 will shrink away from the cell wall. So here's the cell wall of a plant, and all the cell contents is moving away from the cell wall because that's where the greatest concentration of water is, is away from the cell wall because we have that big, large vacuole that's going to be in the middle of it. So here's a basic demonstration. If you put a red blood cell in tonic solution, what's going to happen? Okay, well, water's going to rush out. It's going to get smaller because those kids are littler. So a hypotonic solution, when you're going through it, you put it in there. Well, there's not a lot of stuff, so water's going to rush in. It's going to get bigger, and it may eventually burst. This one did happen to go through what's called lysis or, or bursting. And then when you put it in an isotonic solution, well, you got the same. The cell's going to remain the same because inside and outside are going to be the same thing. Okay. So the second type of transport is called active transport. It's called active because it requires energy, and it's inversely related to passive because it moves molecules from a low concentration to an area of high concentration, and it goes against what we call the concentration gradient. So an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. So there's two main types that we're going to talk about in this class. There are cell pumps, like sodium potassium pumps and stuff like that, but for basic biology, we don't need to worry about that. The two main ones we need are endocytosis and exocytosis. So endo meaning into, cytosis means the cell. So you're going to pull stuff into the cell. The cell is going to surround it and take in the molecules from the environment. Pretty simple, right? Okay, so if it's doing this with, with larger particles, it's called phagocytosis. If it's going, doing it with smaller particles or liquids, it's called pinocytosis. Now, phago and pinno are going to be the same when you're talking about endo or exo. So, exocytosis, the cell wall is going to secrete substances such as hormones and waste. It's going to get rid of it. So, exo to exit, cyto, cell, to exit the cell. Okay, so here's an amoeba. It's trapping food. It's going to form a vacuole. And it's eventually going to have all this food in there. Okay. And it's going to digest it by using lysosomes. So your white blood cells also do this. This is how they get those bacterium cells in there to, to try to kill them. So this is active or passive. Okay, It's going to be active because it's actively having to trap the food, chase down the food, and pull the food into itself. So it, it's going to be endocytosis. So here's a basic picture of an amoeba engulfing a protist. So it starts off right here. It sees this little protist cell. It's going to extend this little pseudopods. It's going to bring it in. Eventually, it's going to digest it. Okay? So your white blood cells engulf bacteria and viruses in the same way. So again, this is active transport. It's actively having to do this. It's going from low concentration to high concentration. It's going against the concentration gradient. And that's it for, um, for unit 4.2. I hope that clarifies osmosis, diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and active transport. And as always, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me or ask, and have a great day.